Alrighty. Hi, everyone. We'll go and get started. Um, so my name is Aaron Ogle. Uh, I'm a software developer at a, uh, an, or an organization called Open Plans. Uh, I have the uh, privilege of being the only guy on the vector track to be talking about rasters, so uh, welcome. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today in particular is a, is a project that I've been working on uh, around measuring walkability called WalkShed.js. And what I'm going to be, kind of the, the details around that are uh, basically doing client-side raster processing, so spatial analysis uh, using OSM data tiles, but doing it in the browser, doing it client-side. Uh, a little bit about where I'm coming from, because I think that's important. Uh, so Open Plans is a nonprofit, and we build open source software basically to make cities better. And so we focus primarily on issues around community engagement, urban planning, urban sustainability, uh, these, these types of things. So it, it's pretty much, from my perspective, the, the best thing ever, because I get to work on open source software, I get to work on uh, GIS and geo tools, uh, but also work on really hard problems uh, related to our, our cities and urban areas. Uh, just real quick, some of the things that we've worked on, uh, we've helped uh, New York City crowdsource its brand new uh, bike share program. So uh, newly launched just a, as of a few, uh, goodness, just like a week or two ago. Um, so hooray, New Yorkers rejoice uh, that we now have bike share. Uh, we also uh, did a project around uh, essentially measuring the beauty of all of the streets in Philadelphia. So taking OSM data, combining it with um, uh, Google Street View, then asking, uh, a pair, doing pairwise comparisons, so saying which one is more beautiful, collecting all of that data. And also uh, working with the New York City Department of Transportation around uh, essentially crowdsourcing where we, uh, basically where improvements need to be made on 4th Avenue in Brooklyn, uh, using Google Street View and Maps, and, and trying to do things in, in very uh, interesting ways. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those. I want to talk about walkability. Uh, walkability is a uh, personal passion of mine. It's something that I think is, is really important and is a really key component to um, urban sustainability is, is being able to measure that and promote that. Um, so before I joined uh, Open Plans, I was, uh, I was a Code for America fellow right before that, but before that, uh, I worked for a firm in Philadelphia called Azavia, and there I worked on a project called walkshed.org. And kind of the gist of this was essentially to be able to measure like the access of um, where somebody could go based on the amenities that are there. So looking at the built environment, looking at the natural environment, and seeing where where can you get to and where are the things that you're looking for? And what we, the, I guess the, the premise behind that was looking at walkability as a surface and not as a network. Oftentimes when you're looking at a walk shed, you're thinking about doing things as a network, like going from this node to this node to this node. But in reality, if you think about it, that's not the way it works. So I like to think about uh, watersheds when I'm thinking about walk sheds. So when it rains, the water comes down, it hits the ground wherever it happens to land, and it decides that it wants to go somewhere. And where it goes depends on uh, any number of factors, uh, primarily slope, uh, but also you know, what is the content of the soil, what does the vegetation look like. And at every single um, moment where it's moving, something is, is basically helping determine where it actually is going to flow. And walkability is kind of the same way. We're not, when we walk around, we're not walking from node to node. We're essentially just walking across a surface. And uh, there are lots of things that help us determine where we are going to go in the built environment and in the natural environment. So things like, uh, what is the road type? Do sidewalks ex exist? What is the speed of the traffic? Is there uh, an interstate there? Is, am I about to walk into a building? Any number of things that you can think to measure you know, that's the surface that we live in. So, you know, how, like, how can we do that? And what's really interesting is while walkshed.org was basically all done ahead of time, like we, we used ARC to uh, do all of these cost distance analyses, which I'll talk about in a second, and then cache them, like, now I'm excited because I, I was thinking, well, what if we did this in the browser? Uh, so let's, let's think about, how, you know, how in the world would you do that? Um, 
It's basically two things. So what I just alluded to was map algebra, uh, specifically a cost distance algorithm. And the other is just JavaScript in Canvas. Um, and I'll kind of get into that uh, in a second. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time kind of talking about map algebra and, and this cost distance al algorithm because it's, it's not that complicated and I, I feel like it's, um, it, it's just really interesting in understanding how this thing is working. So you essentially need two things. One is your cost surface, uh, which is basically just a raster. It's a bitmap um, with a bunch of pixels, but instead of putting colors in a pixel, you put data. And what that data, in our case, is representing how much cost, how much friction uh, one is going to accumulate as you move from one pixel to the other. And the other thing is you need is your source pixels. So your source pixels are basically where you're starting. Where am I standing and where am I trying to get to? Uh, so this is the simplest cost surface raster ever. Um, it's two by two. And this is essentially saying um, that by moving through, do I have a cursor? Yep. Uh, so moving from, um, so this has a cost of one, this has a cost of one, this has a cost of one, this has a cost of three, basically. And we need source pixels. This, all this is saying is I'm going to start here at one, and I'm not going to start at these other places. Fairly simple. Uh, so now we're going to do a little bit of math. And so what this says is uh, if, you're, if you're moving to adjacent pixels, so I said my source pixel was here, and this is where I'm starting. If I move from here to here, the math is fairly easy. I'm going to do one plus one. I'm going to divide it by two. And so um, my cost to get to here is one. I'm going from here to here, so it's one plus three divided by two, so four divided by two is two. And th the difference here with the diagonal, you just use the Pythagorean theorem, like we all uh, hopefully remember. Uh, so it's basically one plus one is two divided by two, which is one times the square root of two, which is about 1.1 for et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically it, except that Nobody is ever working with two by two, and you can't do anything in a single pass. Um, so if we took that example and expanded it, so instead of a two by two like we uh, had before, we have a three by three, and I just made them all fives to, uh, uh, I guess, just to, to point that out. This is what we, would look, what we would have as far as our result after the first pass. We would have what we had before, but we'd have all of these um, Xs, which are essentially no data. We don't know yet. And the way this algorithm works is that you, s at, at this point, we've done our first pass, we've dealt with this pixel, and the next thing we do is we want to go to the minimum cost and then measure from there. So from here, we would measure essentially all of its neighbors. We'd go from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, and here to here. And what we would do is if there's a value that already exists, like this one or this one, and we get a cost that's less, we go ahead and replace it, and then we just go about our merry way. So the next step here would be, so we would have one plus one is six, uh, divided by two, which is three, but since we are moving from our source pixel here, we have to uh, accumulate the costs. So it's going to be this cost of one plus three, so our cost here is four. Um, and so on and so forth, and we just do this over and over and over again until we get our result. Um, if you're, you know, kind of want to geek out on this a little bit, Esri actually has the best documentation that I found on the cost distance algorithm, um, and they've got these these really fabulous examples. This is where I learned how this thing actually worked. Um, so kudos to them, and they have this really great example where they just step you through pass by pass by pass, and it's super cool, if you, if you like that. Okay, so now practically, like, how do we do this, like, on the web? So, you know, that's kind of the theory behind it. Um, so we start with uh, OpenStreetMap data, of course. Um, my uh, personal uh, go-to spot is Mike McGursky's Metro uh, Extracts. I work with them um, pretty frequently. And what's nice is that I can get uh, shape files and I often use those in TileMill. And so TileMill is actually my uh, tool of choice for this because just because most people are generating rasters for, for visualizing doesn't mean you can't embed data in them as well. 
so before I was writing all of these very elaborate Python scripts uh, using GDAL uh, to get all this stuff put together, all the vectors um, rasterized and all of this stuff. But now I can just write a simple CSS um, or Cairo CSS uh, style sheet and boom, I'm good to go. So the way I do this is that I just essentially use the, the B value, so of RGB, and scale everything from zero to 255. So if it's, say, a friction of one, that means that it's very easy to move through that. That might be um, you know, a sidewalk or a park or whatever, however you want to scale it. And then once you get to closer to uh, 255, which would be the bright blue, um, so here you see this, this you know, pond, another pond here, here's an interstate, all of these things. And then we also see um, building footprints and all of these things. So it's essentially scaling it that way. So again, the, the smaller the number, the easier it is to pass through, the bigger it is, great. So at, at this point, we have tiles, uh, a bunch of data tiles. Uh, so what I typically do is take the mbutil script um, and extract all of the PNGs from uh, the, the SQLite mbtiles database itself, and then go ahead and store things on S3 along with my web app. Um, and that really helps with a lot of the cross-domain things, um, so you don't have to worry about your data being in one place and uh, your app running in another place. Because if you start trying to manipulate things in Canvas, you'll run into some issues that way. Uh, so I use uh, this global map tiles library. Uh, there's a JavaScript version of this, um, basically for saying, if I'm here at this lat long, tell me the tiles that uh, I actually need for this area. So I can use that. I get the tiles that I need. I rarely need, or, or I almost always need more than one tile uh, because the tiles are not that big. So I wrote a little utility to essentially fetch the tiles for me and stitch them together into a single cost raster. Because um, from the algorithm, you understand we kind of need everything to be uh, a, a, a single raster. And then, um, so after pouring through all the documentation, I wrote a simple JavaScript library uh, to essentially implement the cost distance algorithm. And it's essentially this. It's uh, uh, two 2D arrays, one of the cost raster, the other of the source raster, and you essentially run calculate, and this is the result that you get. Uh, it's all open source at uh, atogolwaksha.js. Um, and it looks like this. So this is my demo, and so if we kind of look at what's happening, so if I click here, so what just happened was I, I, I clicked, I got my lat long, I buffered that lat long using uh, the global map tiles library to figure out what tiles I actually needed. I went and I fetched those, I stitched them together, I created my source raster, I ran the cost distance calculation, I then took the resulting raw data I colorized it, I wrote it to Canvas, and stuck it on a map, um, all from like, say, now. So it's actually relatively quick, um, looking at all of the things that it's doing. Um, what I think is really interesting about what we're looking at is you can really see how the built environment impacts the access, um, and it does a really good job of visualizing that. So in South Philly, uh, there is, you know, it's an incredible tight, uh, walking grid with very short blocks, and you can see how much access I have here. Um, if I get over here closer to the river, you can see how the river impacts the access that I have. Um, if I, let's see, head over here, on, so there's the train tracks and the main line there. Now what's really interesting is if we start moving out into the suburbs, and you take a look at how, like, the, sp the pattern of sprawl and how that impacts, uh, like, pedestrian access. And you, you start to see, what, this is the part that's really interesting to me, is that you really start to see how the built environment impacts um, the access that we have and, in turn, uh, like, the mobility choices that we have. So... Yeah, just some really crazy shapes out here. Uh, 
Um, so what's next with this? Uh, this is a, uh, I would call it kind of a prototype status at this point. A um, couple of things I would like to see is um, better performance. Right now, everything is happening um, uh, synchronously. There's uh, not using web workers or anything like that to, to improve the process. And everything is, um, we're basically not paralyzing anything. So um, those performance improvements would be great. Um, and we are also um, talking with several clients around like safe routes to schools and things like that, about how we can use this sort of um, information to um, basically advocate for, for more walkable um, cities and towns uh, across the US. Um, so yeah, that is it. So uh, I would be happy to, to take some questions if anybody has some, yeah, right there. Can I, so the question was, can we do point-to-point -point walking routes? Um, the answer is no. Uh, so it's not a, a routing engine per se, um, at least the way this is, is set up. Um, let me think about that. Is it possible with a cost distance algorithm to do that? Um, probably. I'll have to think about it. But the way it's set up, you no, know, you can't do point-to-point -point routing. Uh-huh. Uh, so let me make sure I understood your question. So the question was, um, if the data in real life don't match, how do you fix that? Um, is that right? OK. Um, I, I guess the answer would be, you know, we, we want to make sure that the data matches um, real life as, as much as possible. Um, and so, you know, uh, basically getting you know on ID and and making sure that the data is up to date is is the best way of, of going about it walkable assets yeah yeah for sure um, so I think what we would want to do at that point is figure out how we could do some sort of, uh, I guess, point and polygon query. So we can kind of see what we have. Um, we would want to uh, then, I guess, re-vectorize what we're talking about and then see what is within that. Um, one thing that we could do is essentially look at the cost value for where the assets um, actually intersect. So we would be able to see like what pixel this thing lands on and what the cost is. And that would kind of give us a good sense of how accessible it actually is. And so then instead of just like maybe looking at like concentric rings, um, we could see, you know, how accessible this thing really is and then use that as a way of um, figuring out what's around. Mike. Uh, so uh, the comment was uh, doing land cover and slope would be really cool. And I agree. Um, so that, that's one thing in, in terms of the what's next is like really thinking a little more about what the cost looks like. Um, it's relatively naive at this point because I was focusing on can we get this working in the browser versus can we get the cost friction just right. Um, so right now, like, uh, there's not really good sidewalk data in OSM. So like having that would be really, really great. Um, but also knowing like, am I going uphill or downhill? Am I walking through a marsh or, you know, a scenic park would be awesome. Good. The data used for what? to determine the cost for each cell. Uh, so that's OpenStreetMap. Uh, right. Um, so here, we basically took the, I basically took the street grid and based on the type. So you can see like if the highway is trunk or if it's a trunk link or all of these things, um, I basically said that this was like a medium obstruction um, 
or I wish I could scroll on this, but it's a screenshot. Um, you know, if it's a motorway or a motorway link, or if it's rail or if it's highway, then it's a major obstruction. Um, and I made these variables so I could go through and kind of tweak the values and see how um, the algorithm adjusted to it. Uh, so a lot of this is kind of a, you can just kind of eyeball it and, and see how it works because um, it's, you know, a lot art and a little bit science. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great idea. Um, I've not considered it yet. Um, one thing that we have considered is, and kind of how this, I guess, um, taking one step back, how I got started on this project again, uh, after so many years removed from walkshow.org, was we were talking to a client about um, wanting to measure walkability from the perspective of children. Um, because when you think about that, it, it, it kind of changes your, your perspective on things. Um, and one thing we were thinking about doing is building an app to essentially crowdsource people's uh, neighborhoods. So like the kids can go out with tablets and basically have them note like the things that are obstacles to them that we may not notice. And then we could take that, I, my thought was we could take the crowdsource data that they're doing, incorporate that back into the cost data itself and then see how that impacts what the walkability actually is. Because right now I'm kind of assuming that if you really wanted to cross the street, like you could just cross the street, um, based on based on the uh, you know the, the I guess the class of the road itself. But you know if you're only this tall, then you know that may just be completely impassable. So that would be really interesting. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. um, I've, well, like I said, this is kind of a prototype at this point. Um, but yeah, it would be really cool to essentially to say, well, okay, here's, here's a calculation. Um, you know, let's go out and field test that and, and kind of see how that works and understand, all right, well, what's wrong with my assumptions when generating the cost and what data am I missing? So it may just be, I'm not going to walk here because there's no sidewalk um, at all. But um, if there's no sidewalk data, then you know that's that's a problem with the model. Um, another thing, uh, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with, um, I guess, the impetus for beautiful streets in the first place, is that people will naturally be more inclined to walk down a beautiful street than an ugly street, or a street that feels safe versus one that doesn't feel safe. So being able to like incorporate, like attach that to OpenStreetMap data, like these very nebulous things that we all know are real but are very hard to quantify because it's not really data yet, um, like that would just be super awesome. Uh, I do not now. Um, that's something that uh, would be, I think would be really valuable as a sort of model, is uh, kind of taking into account, uh, essentially kind of going back um, uh, to what he was saying around like what are the amenities that you can actually get to um, in terms of how walkable is a place actually. So transit is definitely a huge asset uh, along with coffee and whiskey. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you so much.